Hi everybody, this is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics, and I'm in my theater room. You can hear there's probably a bit of an echo. I'm using a, a microphone that's on the camera. Um, I am standing against an acoustically treated wall, but that's it. There's no other treatment in here. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on where things are at as of today. So first I'll say this thing has been taking way longer than I ever expected. I had intended for the theater to be complete it, probably a year ago at this point. I was hoping it would be ready soon after I moved in. Um, that was unrealistic for a lot of reasons, including I just couldn't give it the attention it needed to be able to, to get it done. I was busy with other people's projects primarily. Um, however, uh, we have been making progress. A lot of things were difficult to obtain when I needed them. I had made a decision. So one thing I'll mention, I, I, I gave this, uh, I did this video, I should say, that basically was like, things I wish I knew. One of the things I did that I don't recommend other people do, I know it's a bad idea, it's just that my circumstances were a little different, in that I was um, becoming a dealer of products, I was selling things, I was designing bigger and nicer theaters, and this evolved from something I wanted for me to something I needed for my business. And in the process of doing that, originally I had intended to put my Getty's uh, speakers in here, so I built this baffle wall originally, and, and it, all the dimensions and engineering were for speakers the size of those, uh, they were Gedley Abbeys. Um, and so obviously cutouts would have been different. The design was all set up for that. It, it's much deeper than it needs to be. This is about 14 inches deep. I kept saying 12 and then realized that's not that's actually not quite right. It's 14, I measured it again. So it's 14 inches deep. And that was to fit the depth of those speakers. I then was looking at doing the Perlissons instead and was looking at Perlisson models that would have fit into this, which would have been something like the monitors, and trying to figure out how to make that work. And then they told me they were doing the in-wall speakers. I mean, I knew that was on the horizon, but I didn't know if that was like six months, a year, five years. And when they told me the original number, I remember it felt like so far off. I think it was like two years or something from when they had told me about it that I thought it's not going to happen in my room. And then what I realized was they were eminently available. It was like, my theater's not even close to done yet, and they're expecting them in the next few months. So I, I just changed my plans and said, all right, then we're gonna do the in-walls. It makes more sense for what I'm trying to, to show people with this room. And so here we are. I have the speakers, they are here, ready to be installed. The wall is basically done. There are some things that need to be done, and you can see uh, over here, all this unfinished edge and this which is unfinished. This will be largely hidden by the speakers, although I, I mentioned in, in one of the other videos, I made a mistake here. I have to remove some staples that are going to be visible that are over on the edge here. But over here, this is actually going to have black trim. So what's going to happen is there's going to be, call it one by four trim, with some spacers put all around the, the wall's edge. That trim will get mounted onto it, and it will stick out just past a little bit the actual insulation that you can see here covered in the suede. The screen will go over that, and that'll be the finished wall here. There are areas, which you can't see on camera right now, that um, are above and below, which are these large empty bays. And the plan for those for now is actually to fill them with insulation and then put an acoustically transparent fabric over the front of them. It'll probably be a similar suede material. That's, I, I shouldn't say probably, I have purchased, so I will be using a similar suede material to the uh, material you see here and what's being used on the panels in order to create trim panels for that. So that's what you're gonna see there. However, I do have some ideas for some changes in the future, um, which is that I wanna go to possibly a double base array type approach or something similar, in which case I would probably end up putting subwoofers in the top and bottom bays because I can actually get very close to the correct locations doing that. Um, I will actually explain in another video how that works and why close but not quite right may be a big problem or may actually be just fine. Um, so anyway, that's an update of where things are at. The speakers are not installed. They were actually supposed to be installed this week and I would have been excited to do a video to show you, but the guy that was doing it from uh, the integrator I work with, which I'll just give him a little plug here, that's Haven Smart and they're based in the Tampa and Sarasota area for now, but they're expanding like crazy. Um, uh, opening up in other locations. So uh, because this is a higher caliber theater um, than some others and because the detail work and everything that's required to get the technical part of the installation right is higher level, there's a limited number of techs that could do that work and that's true of any integrator. There's always going to be 
um, techs who can, you know, they can pull wire, they can hook network cable up, they can do that stuff fine. And then there's like another level, they can put in the speakers and wire them up and get receivers going and that's fine. And then you're gonna have those installs where you're using the best equipment, it's the most technically complex and you're gonna need your best and most experienced techs. So in my case, that's what the uh, integrator um, and my friend Don Don had decided made the most sense. And the problem is that tech, who's the best tech in our area to do this is sick. And of course I want him to get well. So I'm, I, I'm of course sad that we couldn't do this this week, but it's more important that he gets better. And that has put off putting the speakers in. So once he is better, um, and, and well enough to start coming back and doing this, we're actually gonna probably redo the rack. The rack started out really neat, they did a good job, and then we made a total mess of it. And so we're gonna redo it, make it nice, get all the speakers in. Once the speakers are in, the next steps to getting this complete are gonna be uh, finishing the trim panels for this front wall, hanging all the acoustic treatments that I have. Um, and then for, for now, I'm gonna call that done. Um, which anybody who's ever done a theater knows, once you say, for now I call it done, it's done. But I do have some projects on the horizon and I'm hoping to actually do those uh, with some videos that will continue to evolve the room design and make it better. So the ceiling probably isn't getting done right now other than maybe some absorbers uh, and diffusers. Uh, I actually have a bigger plan for that, but I don't have the materials and it's gonna take probably six to nine months to get them. I have to order them in from Europe. So that's not something I can do now. The other project I'd like to do in the future is um, I really wanted always to do the projector in, a, um, in some sort of a quiet box. I actually had thought about the idea, I kind of regret that I didn't do it, of doing a cutout basically in the wall and the projector would have gone into the office and it would have been wired into the office and then it would have shot through the wall. The reason I didn't do it besides the potential complexities was that had I done that, it would have compromised the sound isolation. Once I've done it, there's like no going back. Like I couldn't have just plugged it up and said, well, that was a mistake. And I was worried because my wife works in there and I wanna be able to watch movies in here um, while she's working. And this is from day one, every sound isolated theater I've ever built for myself has had that issue in mind, which was that I wanna be able at you know, eight or nine o'clock at night when the kids have already gone to bed to be able to come up here and listen to music or watch movies knowing that my wife tends to work evenings and as a result could be in a position where I would be bothering her. And that's an issue, that's a problem. So I built the theater to not do that. So had I done that cutout, even if I had done, so some people are gonna say, well, don't they make like soundproof projector glass? They kind of do, but it's not the same as the wall and that's the problem. So you'd be cutting out an area that's about 12 by 12 or 12 by 14. You'd be inserting uh, basically two panes of glass. Uh, typically it's one is six millimeters and one is like 10 or 12 millimeters. They're not acoustic glass. It's regular, it actually can't be acoustic glass because acoustic glass isn't clear enough. So it ends up having to be special projector glass which has special coatings to make it extra clear and make it so that light can pass through the glass with the minimal of loss. And the best of them now are rated at least at like 99% or something like that, it's really good. So you have basically one that's flat and one gets like an angle to it and that angle keeps it from reflecting and you would put that up there and the projector would shoot through it. And because it's two panes of glass like that with a small air gap, the theory is that that should still stop a lot of sound. Well, this wall is rated at, at you know, in terms of lab ratings, it's probably like an STC 65 or better. The actual rating that we get when I measure it here, it, which is an imperfect way of measuring it, um, and you know, there's always gonna be some mistakes that are made and, and flanking paths and various things that can cause some losses, came in at like STC 62 or so when all was said and done. So with a wall that's that sound isolated, I mean, even the best of those glass ports are gonna be probably STC 30 to 40 in that kind of a range. So the one I just described is probably high 30s. That means I've got like an area that's 12 by 12 inches that totally compromises the wall. And it could have allowed a lot of sound through. Um, and so my wife probably would have complained about that. And, if, and it's fair. I mean, she's doing business. It's not fair for me to have her do a business like this um, where basically I'm bothering her, you know, that, that much. Uh, she can't teach, uh, for instance. So she tutors and she may tutor people in California. So nine o'clock our time, remember, is going to be three hours earlier there. That may be kids that are just out of school, six o'clock and that's a good time for tutoring, something like that. So, um, you know, it, it's an issue to, to worry about. That's, anyway, that was a long version of a story to tell you that I didn't do it. 
So what I'm thinking of doing instead is a hush box, but I want to build it in. I didn't want to just build a box and throw it up there. I want to have it look like a feature. So I have an idea for how to do that, but it's going to take some time for me to get the materials together. Um, and that's a project that, that'll take a little bit. So that's a future project. Like I said, room will probably be done. We'll start shooting some videos in here. We'll do pictures. It'll look good. It'll have a good finished look to it. It just won't be what I had imagined and hoped for as the final design. Um, they're also, like I said, I'm, I have some plans to change this. And so probably the front wall will change its appearance. Um, but that may be like a year down the road or something. I, I, I may actually do something that's just good enough to get it done, which will just basically be all black and not worry about the, the, the rest. So that's the update. I'd love to tell you that the room will be done by end of January. That is my hope, but I don't know for sure that that's true. It may actually be February in some time, but we're, we're getting really close. And I think I'll be able to start shooting videos here to show you guys what it's like. The room has a lot of unique features. Um, I've, I've kind of highlighted those in the past, but just to go through for those that are curious what makes this room different from others. So first is that this is a sound isolated room that was done as good as it could have been done within reason. So I still had to pay for a lot of this. It's not like I got it for free. I definitely didn't get any labor for free. I paid market rate for labor. I got a discount on some materials. And um, I've mentioned this before, but Hush Frame had sponsored this project by giving me the Hush Frame isolators for free for the room. And that was really nice of them. And it was a great opportunity for me to learn about the product and how it works. I, I actually love the product so much that I'm now using it in all my projects. So for those of you who think I'm like using it because I'm getting like a kickback or they gave it to me for free, it's more that they gave it to me so that I could, so they could get it in front of me and I could actually work with it. And once I worked with it, having worked with other alternative project products, I could see the advantages and disadvantages of it. So I wouldn't use it in every project without question but I would use it in most projects because of its advantages. And um, probably that's, a, again, another video to really go into what I like about it over other options. One of them is that while the isolators are a little bit more expensive than the cheapest of the metal clips, the overall cost of doing the wall is cheaper uh, because the general materials used are cheaper. So anyway, it was done with hush frame clips, except for that I did also do double stud walls. And the hush frame clips are actually not used on the double stud walls for the drywall, they're just used to isolate the inner, so there's like an outer and an inner um, shell, if you will, or layer. So the outer wall would be like the wall in the hallway over there or the wall in the office there. The inner shell are the walls that you see inside the room. So that, there's no isolators on those walls. The isolators were actually used to isolate the wall itself from the other walls in the floor and ceiling. The uh, floor floats on those same Hush Fame isolators. It's a special version, but it's essentially the same product, just shorter, it's a lower profile, with insulation. So we've got this kind of bouncy floor. Um, the ceiling is on isolators, and everything is two layers of drywall. There's insulation in all the walls. The HVAC system was, I'll just say special attention was paid to the HVAC system. So I'm not gonna say that like a ton of money was put into making it quieter, that would have been very expensive. I mean, there's mufflers you can buy. I'm looking up because I'm looking at the HVAC stuff, but you know, there's mufflers you could buy. They'd be probably six feet long, 12 inches in diameter, uh, maybe more that you'd have to fit up there and they could end up costing thousands of dollars. So I, I couldn't afford that. Even if I got a discount, it was a lot to be spending on stuff like that. So what I did instead is um, again, probably a topic for another video, but basically there's flex duct because there's nothing up there. And so there's nowhere for the sound to go other than back through here. But we've addressed that by having um, a lot of acoustic insulation, there's some lagging in key places, and then there's uh, boxes that go into the room. Um, I should also say, I said like the sound can go, there's, the sound comes from this room, right? Like the other sound, there's no other sound. It would be my wife's office would have to travel through here. The sound would essentially escape the flex duct before it ever made it here. And so it's a very low concern. So much so that, as I said, I tested the room. The sound isolation between here and the office is extremely high. So even if the, those are compromising it, it's to a small amount because the wall at best, the lab rating was like in the 60s, mid 60s or so. Um, and I got very close to the lab rating. It was just a little low. So you know maybe the HVAC was part of that, but it's not enough to matter. So the, anyway, the HVAC is quiet. The HVAC is actually on right now. Um, and I'm gonna guess that you can't hear much of anything uh, from the HVAC. There is a fan in there, 
and that is slightly, no, I take that back. There's a fan on the light, that's what it is, because I'm hearing a noise and I'm thinking it's the fan in the closet. There's a fan on the light, and that is the only noise that I hear, at least in the background, besides myself talking. So the air noise right now from the HVAC blowing is completely inaudible, and that was essentially by design. Um, so the room is, is more isolated and designed to be quieter uh, than typical. It is quiet enough that I actually can't measure how quiet it is with the equipment that I own. So in the future, I will be taking some steps to try to measure how quiet the room is and just see where we get. The speakers are Perlisten S-Series in-wall speakers, and I did the S7i LRs for the front LCRs. These are an expensive, but like state-of-the-art, high-performance in-wall speaker. They're about as good as it gets. There really aren't, in my opinion at least, better in-wall speakers. There are different ones. There are some other similarly priced, very high-performance speakers, but I, to me, these are the best on the market. One of the reasons why I like them so much is not only do they have really excellent measured performance, but they also play really loud, which allows them to be used in larger rooms. They are, from an output side, overkill for this room. I don't need that much output, but why not? Nothing wrong with a little excess, right? Um, the surround speakers are the S4Is, and so those are like the bookshelves, basically, that they make, but in an in-wall version. They also have plenty of output for this room. Uh, in fact, you could have used uh, seven of those, and it would have made a great home theater. Um, they don't have as good directivity in the vertical, like the, the vertical directivity is not as well controlled. Um, as is true of the S7i. So one of the reasons to like move up in that lineup is that the higher end speaker, specifically the S7i, has significantly better horizontal directivity, uh, I'm sorry, significantly better vertical directivity, slightly better horizontal directivity. And all of that makes for a speaker that just performs better, um, including the extra output. So, you know, if money were no object, I would do seven of those. They'd be all around the room, but money is an object. So I did the S4i's for the surrounds. Um, the overhead speakers, they don't currently make an in-ceiling. Um, that may be something coming in the future, but what I ended up doing instead was my friends at RBH provided me with a new speaker uh, that they make that actually uses a, um, I believe these are the eight inch. I'm trying to see if I can find one of the boxes around here. I believe it's an eight inch. It might be a six and a half inch, so I may have to correct this. But it, uh, anyway, it's a mid-base driver with a coaxial located uh, AMT tweeter. This is a new design from them and it's fully active and so it's going back to a dsp box and so there's um, going to be actually we're going to use the trinov instead of their dsp so the trinov is going to uh, essentially provide all the crossover and eq duties uh, for the overhead speakers they're not probably as good as the perlison speakers and and when perlison does release an, an uh, in-ceiling speaker i may change those out but for now i think they're adequate um, and they'll definitely get the job done the response will be good and they'll work in here the subwoofers in the room, I've talked about these probably before too, but to go over it, there are really high performance and unusual in-wall subwoofers in the back. So again, these came from my friends at RBH. These were a brand new product. I don't even know that they were on the market at the time they sent it to me, but they are available if somebody wanted them. The way to think of this is this was designed to be an in-floor or in-ceiling subwoofer. It's, I believe, nine inches deep. So this is not something that would fit in a typical wall. And it has two of their 12-inch reference drivers. So same drivers that are used in um, the same subwoofers that Gene has in his system, you know, Gene Delasala over at Audioholics. Those subwoofers have pretty high X-Max. They handle, I think, about 800 watts RMS each. So each subwoofer unit that I have is, for the sake of argument, we'll say 1,500 to 2,000 watts RMS of power handling. High excursion, all in an in-wall. I made my own custom mount, so these are fully isolated. I actually used the hush frame plus metal clips because I needed different angles. Um, so these have, we'll call it X, Y, and Z axis isolation, so 3D uh, isolation. They have a lot of articulation because of how I did it. So, so because they're subwoofers and they can move a lot, that allows a lot of isolation for those. Um, do two 12-inch drivers is equal to one 18-inch driver. So for those who are kind of curious what a dual 12 in-wall sub is kind of equivalent to, this is essentially like an 18 inch sub. So I have two 18s equivalent in displacement in the back wall. Uh, the drivers have about 20 millimeters of excursion, which is not crazy, but not bad. Um, and they're in sealed boxes. The boxes, these are not a retrofit sub. They had to be installed before the walls went up. So the boxes are very tall. They're actually almost as tall as I am. Um, I think they're between four and five feet tall. I say almost, I mean, I'm five foot nine. I'm not that short, but 
you know, again, something that's only 10 inches shorter than you, let's say, is a pretty tall subwoofer. So the volume inside the box is somewhere in the neighborhood of between two and a half and three cubic feet. Uh, which is not bad and actually about appropriate for that driver. It does give um, a cube in the 0 0.7, 0 0.75 range, so it's an optimally damped box. That's the rear subwoofers. On the front, I would love to say I have four in the, you know, two in the corners and they're 18s or something. I don't have room. On one side, there's a door and the door would hit the subwoofer and there just isn't enough room to put something there. I could cut the wall open and put a subwoofer in. Um, it's That would be really tricky and because it's a not as deep a wall. So that wall is only about six inches deep. Yes, it's deeper than a normal wall, um, but that's still not deep enough for like a really high output subwoofer. So probably it would have to have, let's say four 12 inch low profile drivers or four 10 inch drivers or something to equal the output of the others. And I'd be opening up the wall. So for now, there's nothing going over there, but on the other side, there's a nice corner area to put a nice big subwoofer. For now, what's going to go there is an 18-inch subwoofer I designed. It's, I actually use kind of off-the-shelf parts to do this, but basically it's a ported box that was designed for a different driver, for the Dayton RS18, and it, that would have been a traditional fourth-order alignment box. And the roll-off, it would have been basically flat to about 20 hertz, and then it would have rolled off. That would have had more output at 20 hertz in a sense, but it would have also had higher group delay and poorer general performance. Instead, what I did was put a Pro Audio style 18 inch driver, has the same amount of excursion, it's about 15 millimeters or so of excursion. Um, it's a very efficient driver, but in that box, the way it loads ends up causing it to have a much shallower roll off down to below port tuning. And so if you look at the way it models, you get what's known as a quasi Butterworth alignment, meaning that it's more like a third order alignment. It starts out more at second order, then it sort of steepens to third order. Now, eventually it hits fourth order. All port, ported boxes will do that. But you see a much more gradual um, curve. When you factor in room gain, what you end up with is a flat response to 20 hertz. It has plenty of headroom. It's very high output, but the group delay is significantly lower than it would have been otherwise. It also doesn't fall apart below port tuning as badly as it would be typical. Eventually it does. I mean, that's again, that's a kind of a requirement of the design. But if you look at how it behaves, what you'll see is that you actually can go a bit farther below port tuning before you completely lose control of that driver. And so that's what's gonna go there. I don't know that I'm gonna keep that there though um, because I really would like to put a Perlissen subwoofer in here. So there probably is gonna be a Perlissen D215S. In fact, if I can get away with it, I'd really like to do like a custom one and like a really cool finish. Maybe you know, I like bright colors. So I was thinking like tangerine orange and maybe tangerine orange with a wood finish like walnut would be kind of cool. So we'll see. Uh, I'm not going to guarantee that because I have to pay for that. And uh, the custom finishes are 25% extra. So I need to kind of decide if that makes sense. But I think it would look cool and stand out in the room. Um, the acoustic treatments in the room I've discussed also in other videos. But just again to go through it, um, there are some panels that were custom made for me by Acoustamac. Um, they're pretty standard panels. When I say custom, they're not like a fancy panel. It's just I wanted something that was larger format. So these are four foot by six foot, two inch thick, eight pound density rock wool insulation. They have a suede outer covering. And um, so that makes up a lot of the absorption in the room. There's one panel that's actually a picture panel. I think I've shown that before, but you'll see that when it goes up. It's a piece of artwork, abstract, bright colors, kind of helps lighten up what is otherwise a drab black room. And then there is the walnut panels that I have shown you guys before as well. And that sort of mixes things. And then for diffusion, I'm actually working on finishing the deal to get those, but there's a panel called the Good Panel, G-U-D. It is a uh, form of quadratic residue diffuser, QRD diffuser, but it's a different approach. They work really well over a wide bandwidth. They're really shallow, they're only two inches, um, and some will think that that's not a good thing, but the vast majority of benefit from diffusers actually comes in the higher frequencies. So the two inches is plenty for a fairly effective diffuser if it's a well-designed one. Most two inch ones are not. This is a really well-designed one, good measurements, um, really excellent performance. So I'm gonna be putting those in the room. There's gonna be 10 of those, and then um, I'll, I'll kind of figure out what the other diffusion that might go into the room would end up being. I've got some ideas, but, but for now, the good panels are kind of the core of what I'm doing. Um, and 10 of those panels, they're each four square feet, so that's 40 square feet of diffusion that's going into the room. There is some diffusion from the um, slat panels, uh, so that's not like completely diffusionless, if you will, but I don't treat them that way. 
Um, and then in terms of absorption area, I'd have to add it all up, but there's a lot, um, probably too much actually. I'm a little concerned about that. It actually, I keep saying that from a calculation standpoint, it's like right on and everything fits. I'm having trouble fitting all the panels in the room. I, I laid everything out in, in uh, uh, like a 3D program and made it all fit and it all fit. And then I realized there were certain things that I'd forgotten to put in like light switches. <laughs> And so I'm not 100% sure it all fits still, so we'll have to figure that out, but I may change things on the fly. Uh, that is one reason to design ahead of time and do it right, and you should design everything in, including doorknobs, light switches, and outlets, because if you don't, you'll end up with a problem like I think I might have. Um, and I guess I'll let you know, maybe that'll be another thing I wish I had done differently next time, um, is <laughs> model in the light switches. So anyway, that's an update. That's where we're at. Uh, hopefully you guys are finding this uh, fun and interesting. So thanks for watching. Please subscribe. I have a lot more coming.